The civil war launched by the Tigray People's Liberation Front against the government of Ethiopia continues. KPFA's Ann Garrison spoke to Jamal Kantas, a photographer and reporter on the ground in the country's Amhara region. Jamal Countess and I spoke first about the TPLF's occupation of the town of Lalibela, a World Heritage Site because it is home to 11 massive rock-hewn Ethiopian Orthodox churches built below ground in the 12th and 13th centuries. Jamal Countess, you're on the ground in Ethiopia. Could you tell us where you are and what you're doing there? I am currently between Bahadur and Gondor, and I am documenting the IDP situation and interviewing IDPs who have been made IDPs either due to the war itself or the latest round of TPLF aggression and invasion into the Amhara region. And are you working for Getty Images or for the UN or both? No, I'm working for Getty Images as a contractor and I'm also going to be contributing content to several human rights organizations and that's Okay. It. And what are you seeing there where you are? I've been covering IDPs in Ethiopia since the start of this war over the course of several trips. And what I'm seeing with this trip is widespread trauma. Honestly, having grown up in an environment that was quasi-military and knowing a lot of vets and a lot of people who have been through traumatic situations, I'm seeing a lot of severe trauma in people from young children to adults to the elderly. It's just people are really beyond shell-shocked about having to leave their homes, witnessing their loved ones being killed, being brutalized, and having to walk sometimes two to three weeks to get to a safe place. So it's mind-boggling. You can think that you've been a photographer for 30-some years and you've seen things, and my colleagues who cover war on a regular will talk to you about things that they see, but this is just this is surreal. And these are largely ethnic Amhara fleeing the Tigray People's Liberation Front? Yes, mainly, I would say 95% Amhara. I did speak to several Ago people yesterday, which technically we can say are Amhara as well, even though the TPLF tried their best to cause division between the different ethnic groups. The Ago are a smaller ethnicity, but technically are still Amhara. And I hope that my Ethiopian listeners will forgive me if I'm slightly off on that. But the way it's explained to me is that they are Amhara as well. And how far into Amhara are the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, from Tigray? How much of Amhara have they penetrated? Well, they try to penetrate on several fronts, Afar, Walkait, and this region, which is Gondor slash North Gondor, Wallo. I don't have a map in front of me, but I can tell you that there's almost like a finger or a bulge that extends out from the Tigray border that encompasses Raya, Kolbo, Lalibela, and I want to say Waldia, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a significant portion, a narrow, bulging, finger-like portion that extends into the Amhara region. From Tigray? From Tigray, yeah. Okay, tell us about Lalibela. Lalibela, as most people, I hope, would know, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's home to 11 rock churches that were built by King Lalibela in the 12th, 13th century and is known around the world as a major, major, major site in the Orthodox Christian and beyond world. It's the place where I started a lot of my research into Eastern religion. It's a place where I met the woman who became my wife. <laughs> I have several friends in the priesthood and the general populace from Lalibela. And right now it's been occupied by the TPLF for over a month. I thought it was longer than that. It seems like it was... Yeah, two months actually. Yeah. I just said just to stay safe, but I didn't have the exact number in front of me. Either way, it's a pretty long time. Should I just say it like that? Okay. It seems like the TPLF may be using Lalibela, this precious World Heritage Site, sort of like human shields because the Ethiopian Defense Forces won't want to fire on them there and risk damaging the churches. Yes, well, it's a multifaceted situation. I'm basing my information off of two separate interviews with some IDPs from Lalibela. When the TPLF entered Lalibela, first they attempted to install 
mortars on the grounds of the churches, which would have given them a tactical advantage because the actual ground level of the churches is below the mountain mm -hmm. level that, you, that they were carved out of. So they would have, would have been in sunken positions. Mm -hmm. The priest of the churches argued against that. And actually four mm -hmm. young men died in a series of arguments at a church called Medhani Elam, which is the largest of the Rakian churches. Mm -hmm. So they relocated the mortars and then later the heavy artillery mm -hmm. to areas adjacent to the churches mm -hmm. so that even best efforts and the most precise military strikes would still cause significant damage to the grounds around the churches, if not the churches themselves. Anyone who's familiar with Lalibela will also understand that there is the first church built by King Lalibela is in a mountain called Ashton Mariam with two other churches. Mm -hmm. The TPLF have fortified that mountain peak, which basically gives you at least a 10 mile range of visibility over the entire area. Mm -hmm. So they fortified Ashton Mariam, they fortified mm -hmm. the areas around the churches. They've even fortified the monastery at Naktalab Mm -hmm. which is at the road, it's outside of Lalibela and leads into Lalibela. The family I spoke to yesterday said that there were heavy machine guns at Noctilab, which is one of the most cherished monasteries in the region. In addition to that, when the TPLF entered Lalibela, in typical fashion, they were preceded by their child soldiers, children ages 13 to 15, then the regular cadre, and then another group of individuals who were responsible primarily for taking looted items back to Tigre. Items looted from the churches? Items looted from the entire town. When they came into Lalibela, they uh, told the world, we're just here as a peaceful occupation. But according to the witnesses that I interviewed, they took ambulances, medical supplies, money. They looted the banks. They looted the local government buildings. Whatever they did not loot, they burned and destroyed and food resources have been allocated specifically to the TPLF and the general population, whoever did not leave, who's still there, they get basically the crumbs or what's left if they get that. Okay, you mean the crumbs of what's left? After the TPLF eats, yes. Okay, but on the food aid coming in? in these there's, no massive food aid, there, there's no food aid getting into Lalibela because Lalibela is occupied. Okay. Lalibela is being turned into what Monte Cassino was during World War II. It's being turned into a fortress. Okay. So what about the food aid trucks going in? I mean, it's just bizarre. 428 of 466 have reportedly disappeared, and the UN says they don't know where they are. Yeah, we're stepping onto this really volatile ground of just who's complicit with aiding and abetting the TPLF war effort. Over 460 food trucks, massive flatbed trucks go into Tigray, 38 come out. And people say they don't know where they are. They, in the age of satellite tracking and GPS, nobody knows where they are or the drivers who took those trucks there. Then on the flip side, we do see these military offenses being conducted by the TPLF, where they are ferrying massive amounts of troops to the front. Mm -hmm. Is that a coincidence or by design or who knows? I mean, I'll leave it up to you and your listeners. What about the seven UN aid workers who were expelled this week? That was all over the Western press too. Well, a good amount of information has been made available on social media as to some of the behaviors of these seven individuals. In the Ethiopian government, I saw released a press release on the reasons why they were expelled. Mm -hmm. And they relate to aiding and abetting mm -hmm. the TPLF war effort mm -hmm. and also disseminating false information. I mm -hmm. actually read one of the uh, Twitter posts of one of the men who was expelled. And mm -hmm. he basically on his Twitter feed stated that the Ethiopian government uh, attacked the government of Tigray to remove the government of Tigray, then the government of Tigray started response with the you know, the command attacks, which I think anybody who knows the situation is completely false. It's a bold lie. We all know that the Northern Command attacks started on November 3rd into November 4th, and they were a preemptive strike by the TPLF. The TPLF actually admitted that. So you have 
individuals who basically were less than honest about their activities and actually were TPLF loyalists, if not direct members of the TPLF. Okay, how many IDPs would you say there are there in the region where you are? Where I am right now, I am um, working amongst scattered camps containing up to 300,000 IDPs. Oh. The Wallow region, the region Wallow Desse, that region is just to the east of me, has the lion's share of IDPs from this conflict in the Amhara region. And those numbers combined with the numbers in my region are reaching just about a million. And we're not hearing anything about this because of the uh, relationship TPLF has with the Western establishment and Western media and the network that the TPLF established when they were in power, where in which they control the narrative and have controlled it for several years. And what would you say the story is? I said the story is a million people traumatized mm -hmm. not only by war, but by the confusion and the vitriol coming from the West. I was at an IDP camp yesterday and I was documenting an aid organization, a local aid organization feeding people at this IDP camp. And when the guy heard that I was American, he said, I don't want to talk to him. And so my escorts had to explain like, no, he is here for you. He's here to talk about the IDP situation. He is basically a neutral, objective journalist. Mm -hmm. And so then the guy, he opened up to me, you know, mm -hmm. we talked him off the ledge, but you know, he basically said, I don't even want to hear the word America because Americans have done so much damage to this situation and you have aided and abetted the TPLF. We lived under the TPLF for 27 years. We saw them disappear, two million Amhara. We saw them commit atrocities. We've seen them do so much, basically form this ethnic apartheid system. And then the Americans, because of this whole Black Hawk Down relationship that they started with the TPLF, Americans wanna maintain that relationship and see them come back into power. The U.S. has aided and abetted the TPLF. We helped to train their Agazi troops, for goodness sakes. We have done so much for them, and that was because of what Mellis promised during the War on Terror. But the U.S. turned a blind eye when Mellis turned all of those resources on the destruction and subjugation of anybody that was not ethnic Tigrayan in Ethiopia. So it's actually shameful that we stand as this, this pillar of human rights and X, Y, and Z. And we supported somebody who basically helped to destroy multiple millions of lives in his own country. Okay, and is there anything else you'd like to say? I would like to tell people to educate themselves on the situation in Ethiopia, to educate themselves as to who the TPLF actually are and to understand, take it from somebody who has been to my cadre, who has been to Humera, somebody who lived in Ethiopia for years during the TPLF reign and who saw the transition into the Abiy government, that you're dealing with a group that is maniacal and diabolical and has tight control over the media narrative because they formed a massive media network with partners in Ethiopia and outside of Ethiopia to control the narrative to assure their position in power. Okay, and just to be totally straightforward here, you are from Brooklyn. I'm actually okay. from Baltimore. <laughs> I, li I lived in Brooklyn for 20, 20 some years, but I was doing research for a book I was writing and I went to La Libella in 2013 and that's when I met most of the people who are my friends now mm -hmm. and actually also the woman who became my wife. She is ethnic Oromo and Amhara. My children are ethnic Oromo, Amhara, and Baltimorean. <laughs> okay. So um, there is no bias. I have a cousin that lives in McKelly, who I actually went to see when I was able to go to McKelly in June. We live in a multi-ethnic family. Mm -hmm. Ethiopians are by and large mixed people. Oromo, Amhara, Amhara Tigre, Oromo Tigre, etc. so forth, you know, Gambala, Amhara. Mm -hmm. And so this whole ethnic-based identity and, and this ethnic concept is completely destructive. So my allegiance is to God first and to human rights and justice for anybody. And what's happening here is just based solely on wanting to see justice in Ethiopia for Ethiopians. Okay, Jamal Countess, thank you for speaking to Pacifica Radio. Thanks for having me.